Chapter 1, The Sound of the Shell The boy with fair hair lowered himself down the last few feet of rock and began to pick his way toward the lagoon. Though he had taken off his school sweater and trailed it now from one hand, his gray shirt stuck to him and his hair was plastered to his forehead. All round him the long scar smashed into the jungle was a bath of heat. He was clambering heavily among the creepers and broken trunks when a bird, a vision of red and yellow, flashed upwards with a witch-like cry, and this cry was echoed by another. Hi, it said. Wait a minute. The undergrowth at the side of the scar was shaken, and a multitude of raindrops fell pattering. Wait a minute, the voice said. I got caught up. The fair boy stopped and jerked his stockings with an automatic gesture that made the jungle seem for a moment like the home counties. The voice spoke again. I can't hardly move with all these creeper things. The owner of the voice came backing out of the undergrowth so that twigs scratched on a greasy windbreaker. The naked crooks of his knees were plump, caught and scratched by thorns. He bent down, removed the thorns carefully, and turned around. He was shorter than the fair boy and very fat. He came forward, searching out safe lodgments for his feet, and then looked up through thick spectacles. Where's the man with the megaphone? The fair boy shook his head. This is an island. At least I think it's an island. That's a reef out in the sea. Perhaps there aren't any, aren't any grown-ups anywhere. The fat boy looked startled. There was that pilot, but he wasn't in the passenger cab and he was up in front. The fair boy was peering at the reef through screwed-up eyes. All them other kids, the fat boy went on. Some of them must have got out. They must have, mustn't they? The fair boy began to pick his way as casually as possible toward the water. He tried to be offhand and not too obviously uninterested, but the fat boy hurried after him. Aren't there any grown-ups at all? I don't think so. The fair boy said this solemnly, but then the delight of a realized ambition overcame him. In the middle of the scar, he stood on his head and grinned at the reversed fat boy. No grown-ups! The fat boy thought for a moment. That pilot? The fair boy allowed his feet to come down and sat on the steamy earth. He must have flown off after he dropped us. He couldn't land here, not in a plane with wheels. We was attacked. He'll be back all right. The fat boy shook his head. When we was coming down, I looked through one of them windows. I saw the other parts of the plane. There were flames coming out of it. He looked up and down the scar. And this is what the cabin done. The fair boy reached out and touched the jagged end of a trunk. For a moment, he looked interested. What happened to it, he asked. Where's it got to now? That storm dragged it out to sea. It wasn't half dangerous with all them tree trunks falling. There must have been some kids still in it. He hesitated for a moment, then spoke again. What's your name? Ralph. The fat boy waited to be asked his name in turn, but this proffer of acquaintance was not made. The fair boy called Ralph smiled vaguely, stood up, and began to make his way once more toward the lagoon. The fat boy hung steadily at his shoulder. I expect there's a lot more of us scattered about. You haven't seen any others, have you? Ralph shook his head and increased his speed. Then he tripped over a branch and came down with a crash. The fat boy stood by him, breathing hard. My auntie told me not to run, he explained, on account of my asthma. Asthma? That's right. Can't catch my breath. I was the only boy in our school what had asthma, said the fat boy with a touch of pride. And I've been wearing specs since I was three. He took off his glasses and held them out to Ralph, blinking and smiling, and then started to wipe them against his grubby windbreaker. An expression of pain and inward concentration altered the pale contours of his face. He smeared the sweat from his cheeks and quickly adjusted the spectacles on his nose. Them fruit. He glanced round the scar. Them fruit, he said. I expect... He put on his glasses, waited away from Ralph, and crouched down among the tangled foliage. I'll be out again in just a minute. Ralph disentangled himself cautiously and stole away through the branches. In a few seconds, the fat boy's grunts were behind him, and he was hurrying toward the screen that still lay between him and the lagoon. He climbed over a broken trunk and was out of the jungle. The shore was fledged with palm trees. These stood or leaned or reclined against the light, and their green feathers were a hundred feet up in the air. The ground beneath them was a bank covered with coarse grass, torn everywhere by the upheavals of fallen trees, scattered with decaying coconuts and palm saplings. Behind this was the darkness of the forest proper, and the open space of the scar. Ralph stood one hand against a gray trunk, and screwed up his eyes against the shimmering water. Out there, perhaps a mile away, the white surf flinked on a coral reef, and beyond that the open sea was dark blue. Within the irregular arc of coral, the lagoon was still as a mountain lake blue of all shades, and shadowy green and purple. The beach between the palm terrace and the water was a thin stick, endless apparently, for to Ralph's left the perspectives of palm and beach and water drew to a point at infinity, and always, almost visible, was the heat. He jumped down from the terrace. The sand was thick over his black shoes, and the heat hit him. He became conscious of the weight of clothes, 
kicked his shoes off fiercely, and ripped off each stocking with its elastic garter in a single movement. Then he leapt back on the terrace, pulled off his shirt, and stood there among the skull-like coconuts, with green shadows from the palms and forest sliding over his skin. He undid the snake clasp of his belt, lugged off his shorts and pants, and stood there naked, looking at the dazzling beach in the water. He was old enough, twelve years and a few months, to have lost the prominent tummy of childhood, and not yet old enough for adolescence to have made him awkward. You could see now that he might make a boxer as far as width and he heaviness of shoulders went, but there was a mildness about his mouth and eyes that proclaimed no devil. He patted the palm trunk softly and forced at last to believe in the reality of the island, laughed delightedly again, and stood on his head. He turned neatly onto his feet, jumped onto the beach, knelt, and swept a double armful of sand into a pile against his chest. Then he sat back and looked at the water with bright, excited eyes. Ralph! The fat boy lowered himself over the terrace and sat down carefully, using the edge as a seat. I'm sorry I've been such a time. Them fruit! He wiped his glasses and adjusted them on his button nose. The frame had made a deep pink V on the bridge. He looked critically at Ralph's golden body and then down at his own clothes. He laid a hand on the end of a zipper that extended down his chest. My auntie. Then he opened the zipper with decision and pulled the whole windbreaker over his head. There. Ralph looked at him sidelong and said nothing. I expect we'll want to know all their names, said the fat boy, and make a list. We ought to have a meeting. Ralph did not take the hint, so the fat boy was forced to continue. I don't care what they call me, he said confidentially, so long as they don't call me what they used to call me at school. Ralph was faintly interested. What was that? The fat boy glanced over his shoulder, then leaned toward Ralph. He whispered, they used to call me Piggy. Ralph shrieked with laughter. He jumped up. Piggy! Piggy! Ralph, please. Piggy clasped his hand and in apprehension. I said I didn't want... Piggy! Piggy! Ralph danced out into the hot air of the beach and then returned as a fighter plane with wings swept back and machine gun Piggy. Sheow! He dived in the sand at Piggy's feet and lay there laughing. Piggy! Piggy grinned reluctantly, pleased despite himself at even this much recognition so long as you don't tell the others. Ralph giggled into the sand. The expression of pain and concentration returned to Piggy's face. Half a sec. He hastened back into the forest. Ralph stood up and trotted along to the right. Here, the beach was interrupted abruptly by the square motif of the landscape. A great platform of pink granite thrust up uncompromisingly through forest and terrace and sand and lagoon to make a raised jetty four feet high. The top of this was covered with a thin layer of soil and coarse grass and shaded with young palm trees. There was not enough soil for them to grow to any height, and when they reached perhaps twenty feet, they fell and dried, forming a crisscross pattern of trunks, very convenient to sit on. The palms that still stood made a green roof, covered on the underside with a quivering tangle of reflections from the lagoon. Ralph hauled himself onto this platform, noted the coolness and shade, shut one eye, and decided that the shadows on his body really were really green. He picked his way to the seaward edge of the platform and stood looking down into the water. It was clear to the bottom and bright with the efflorescence of tropical weed and coral. A school of tiny glittering fish flicked hither and thither. Ralph spoke to himself, sounding the bass spring strings of delight. Whizzow! Beyond the platform, there was more enchantment. Some act of God, a typhoon perhaps, or the storm that had accom accompanied his own arrival, had banked sand inside the lagoon so that there was a long, deep pool in the beach with a high ledge of pink granite at the further end. Ralph had been deceived before now by the specious appearance of depth in a beach pool, and he approached this one preparing to be disappointed. But the island ran true to form, and the incredible pool, which clearly was only invaded by the sea at high tide, was so deep at one end as to be dark green. Ralph inspected the whole thirty yards carefully and then plunged in. The water was warmer than his blood, and he might have been swimming in a huge bath. Piggy appeared again, sat on the rocky ledge, and watched Ralph's green and white body enviously. You can't half swim. Piggy. Piggy took off his shoes and socks, arranged them carefully on the ledge, and tested the water with one toe. It's hot. What did you expect? I didn't expect nothing. My auntie. Sucks to your auntie. Ralph did a surface dive and swam underwater with his eyes open. The sandy edge of the pool loomed up like a hillside. He turned over holding his nose, and a golden light danced and shattered just over his face. Piggy was looking determined and began to, t to take off his own shorts. Presently he was palely and fatly naked. He tiptoed down the sandy side of the pool and sat there up to his neck in water, smiling proudly at Ralph. Aren't you going to swim? Piggy shook his head. I can't swim. I wasn't allowed. My asthma. Sucks to your asthma. Piggy bore this with a sort of humble patience. You can't half swim well. 
Ralph paddled backwards down the slope, immersed his mouth, and blew a jet of water into the air. Then he lifted his chin and spoke. I could swim when I was five. Daddy taught me. He's a commander in the Navy. When he gets leave, he'll come and rescue us. What's your father? Piggy flushed suddenly. My dad's dead, he said quickly, and my mom. He took off his glasses and looked vainly for something with which to clean them. I used to live with my auntie. She kept a candy store. I used to get ever so many candies, as many as I liked. When will your dad rescue us? Soon as he can. Piggy rose dripping from the water and stood naked, cleaning his glasses with a sock. The only sound that reached them now through the heat of the morning was the long grinding roar of the breakers on the reef.